Good day, everyone. My name is Manish Rai, and I'm thrilled to be hosting this webinar. I'm the Vice President of Product Marketing at SnapLogic. I'm really excited to have two AI and data science luminaries with me in this discussion today about generative AI and emerging use cases for integration. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is recorded. We will be sharing a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content and share it with your colleagues. We also invite you to add comments and questions. Uh, please look for Q&A chat box on your screen. Feel free to input your questions throughout the session and we'll respond to you during the event or we'll connect with you after over the email. Now, without further ado, let me let us get started with the session today. I'm really excited to have Kirk Bourne here. Kirk is a data science and AI luminary. He spent 20 years at NASA and uh, worked on many interesting projects, including the Hubble telescope as well. So welcome, Kirk. Really excited to have you in this discussion. Thank you, Manish. It's really great to be here today. Uh, my, my professorship was actually astrophysics. I, I don't want to claim <laughs> I have any Sorry. experience. I don't want to claim any experience in aeronautical engineering. Those are real, okay. real rocket scientists. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, really excited to have Jeremiah Stone, who's our CTO at SnapLogic. And he's got a pretty distinguished uh, background as well. He was a general manager at GE Digital for... APM software, before that a CTO of GE Energy and Vice President at SAP. So uh, thanks for joining us, Jeremiah, today. Awesome to be here. It's an exciting time to be working in our field and you know using uh, data to help the world run better. And it's, it's a really great time to come and exciting to talk to you, uh, Kirk, with your background, having tried to do this for many years and having driven the science that we're working with today. It's, it's really an exciting time for us to, to get together. So uh, as you all who are involved with the technology world are seeing that piece of change has been accelerating. In my career itself, uh, I've seen and lived through several platform disruptions. Uh, if we go back to 1993, it, the Netscape browser and HTML triggered the inter internet revolution. Fast forward to 2007, iPhone uh, ushered the mobile revolution and uh, another way of consuming technology. And then following it was the cloud. And today all the rage is around Gen AI and many of the experts believe it's going to be a bigger and faster disruptor than any of the previous ones we have seen. Kirk, you have been in the industry a bit longer than me. Uh, uh, what's your opinion on these disruptions? Yeah, I think you're, you're right about this, uh, this sort of sequence that's taking place here. Uh, so I was around at the birth of the PC era, you know, where we went from having to access computing through a mainframe to having computing on our desktops, you know, the PC revolution. But what's fascinating about these, this story here is is that the time, uh, you know, gap, so to speak, between uh, each of these is getting shorter and shorter. You know, from the PC to the internet to the smartphone to the cloud to, you know, to this era of generative AI, the the the, the transformation, the digital disruption, time, you know, time lapse, so to speak, is getting shorter and shorter. And so, what that basically means to me is that is that people uh, used to be you could learn a skill and carry that skill for an entire career. But now basically the skills you need are changing every few years. So, so, uh, so fundamentally, a lot of things that you do are gonna be different a few years from now than you're doing today. Just like the things we're doing today are so very different from what we were, we were doing 10 years ago, which is very different from what we were doing you know, 10 or 20 years before that. So, so, uh, so essentially every single thing you have on the slide is, has spanned my career. So I, I've, I've seen like at, at least these five major disruptions just in my own career. So. Uh, this this is the, uh, the the world we live in, and and it's important for the people who are doing these tasks, doing the work, uh, to not only be aware of it, 
uh, but to feel comfortable with it and, and, to, and to see their place in it. And I think that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so as, as you saw, even though IT has been getting more and more resources, they're not able to keep up with the pace of change and the so-called digital dex dexterity gap or the delivery gap keeps on increasing exponential with uh, it as well. So, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of research which points to anywhere between 40 to 60% of the IT backlog is around integration. Uh, Jeremiah, what, what are your observations here? Well, it's interesting. There's a, a comment in the chat that tool-based skills are becoming worthless and system-based skills are what mattered uh, from, from Chris uh, in the chat. And, and that really resonates. Uh, you know, I think what, what I've seen over the course of, of my career, also starting off on a, you know, a Solaris terminal working at uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research, what I first started off was, you know, you learn a specific skill set for this, you know, particular system you're interacting with, but of course, each individual can only see a small part of the whole. And I think what's happening, you know, right now is, is we continue to see specialization and capability in individual areas, but that individual areas get, get smaller and the systems continue to get more capable and, and, you know, keep, you know, trying to approach what we're looking to do from an intention perspective with, with, you know, helping to run our world. And, and that fundamentally means that the velocity is being driven by many individuals at, at scale with more and more effective uh, capabilities. And that makes our systems more and more um, complex. And so systems thinking, systems approach is, is absolutely necessary. This graphic, this chord graph here, uh, we actually generated internally off of our global um, population. And, and this, this does represent, uh, you know, right now about 7 trillion messages per month um, you know, passing uh, across um, our, you know, small corner of the world. And it really does indicate that, you know, as we keep going, the amount of connective tissue, if you will, uh, between our systems continues to grow. And so we must master, you know, that system-based um, approach, system-based thinking, and, and really, as Kirk points out, help people to, you know, deal with that um, complexity in a way that's empowering, supportive, and and helps to manage the continuous evolution of the technologies we're working with. Great. Um, just just a comment on that uh, that that slide there. So when I first saw this, I, I didn't realize this was actually generated from the real data that Stamp Logic has on on uh, you know the apps and and the applications and the tools and the connectors uh, that people are using within the Snap Logic system. And so that's so it's it's ever it, I mean it's a pretty picture, but it's also phenomenal and and, and the re, and that it's, it represents the reality of how people need to connect things in order to do their job. And there was this thing on the other the preceding slide. I don't know if you want to go back there. I hate to have you going backwards. That's that's a sin, I guess, in online talks. But in that preceding slide, we had that uh, sort of growth curve and and uh, the, the different transformations. But on the right side, we see this. What I th at first thought was like a DNA sequence, right? <laughs> it, it sort of looks like a DNA sequence, but what, each little dot there represents a different business app within a different category. And so the, the complexity of the space is enough to frighten anyone away, but, but what's empowering is the connections that make those individual apps more powerful. And, then, and that, again, is what's represented in, in the next slide. So I'm sorry, I'm making you jump around here. But it's the, it's the connections. It's, it's sort, of like, sort of like your brain is a very complex thing, but it's the synapses. It's the connections between the different things that, you, that are firing in your brain that actually makes you a working intelligent being, right? Because it, uh, uh, otherwise, how could you sort out the tens of millions, of, if not billions or trillions of synapses in your brain and actually navigate a, a, your, your life, right? So the way a business navigates its life is finding these connections, bringing those connections together to make something happen, to, to create something. And then and putting this tool or, or a system, as Chris Serdak was saying, putting the system in people's hands that allows them to make these connections, to draw value, and, and to you know to bring you know better customer service, better customer results, as well as better business results, uh, that's what's really empowering to me. And seeing uh, the, these things that you're showing us here, the, the, the value of connecting things, integrating things, which is I guess is the theme today, 
and I get, I'm looking forward to how we continue our conversation because I, I, I've had the preview, right? I know what we're coming up against, coming up for in the slides here, but the, so how generative AI really helps us to do this integration of these very diverse types of apps within the business world. Totally. And I also think, you know, a, a point that, you know, Chris is making in the chat here as well is that the recommendation is to lean in and, and use the tools that we have. But also, I think embedded here is learning system thinking, learning how to analyze complex systems, difficult problems and decompose them into piecewise elements is has always been the superpower. Uh, but we often have gotten tripped up on the the technology of the day and and you know, sometimes it feels like we are, you know, still in the mud and sticks phase of all of this, that you know, our colleagues in, in sort of, as you pointed out, real engineering fields have had literally thousands of years of learning that they're standing on top of. And, you know, we're, um, what, coming up on 100 years uh, in our field. And so it's sort of simultaneously the most complex and least well understood endeavor um, you know, our species has, has embarked upon. And I think the real promise of generative AI, as you point out, is, is to help shift our focus towards problem solving, teaming, working on, on different uh, challenges, and less about learning a specific sort of hard bounded uh, set of skills. Great. Um, the, the other issue is that as we start driving change, it takes more than the technology. The people uh, and there's culture involved in, in that and processes involved. And Jeremiah, you lived through all these and driving change as a general manager before. Uh, how do you think enterprises can increase that pace of change? And what were you able to do in your organizations before to drive that faster change? Uh, well, a lot of my thinking, you know, I think has been shaped in recent years by uh, work that's been done in, in sociology around, you know, what types of cultures create high performance. Um, and Westrom in particular, uh, some research that was popularized via the, the DevOps movement, um, you know, with, with some of the, the work that's been done around how we think about, you know, individual behaviors at scale. I really do think we're now biasing towards uh, cultures, architectures, and operating models that um, have a bias for performance, creativity, um, and and growth. And I think on a, a culture point of view, um, you're really looking to empower people to be creative in their local context rather than you know strict bureaucracies or, or command and control approaches. Um, architecture moves to being um, sort of a higher level of abstraction. Uh, composability becomes important uh, because of the scale and complexity we're working on. And then, you know, because of those two interplays, I think, you know, we're really going to continue to bias for, for collaborative models where people with different types of expertise can come together. Um, and, and I think that's something we've all been working on for the course of our careers. But I do think that, you know, these are the types of elements of, of setting up a team strategy that really indicates success or failure, you know, as we continue to accelerate. Uh, Kirk, I think you, you've been as a consultant at Booz Allen and others worked with a lot of companies. Uh, what have you seen uh, from your perspective, successful companies who are able to keep up with the pace of change done? Well, I certainly think the uh, sort of the empowering of, uh, I would say, uh, if, if I can use this phrase, sort of, sort of the troops of the trenches, so to speak. Uh, so, so, so top-down management, you know, might have been, you know, what worked worked in the past. Uh, but I think now you really, really need to get the voices of, of the people who are who are doing the work. Uh, and I and I actually saw some cases in, in some of the clients we work with at Booz Allen where they really took hold of this and they and they they, they uh, created basically what they called idea thons it's sort of like a hackathon but instead of hacking something or, or coding something it's actually come up with ideas and so basically inviting to the uh, to this event i mean would be everyone i mean it's it's, it's the senior people it's the junior people it's it's whoever and uh, it, it was really surprising to see sort of the just sort of the creative process working in that type of environment where you sort of like it, but I guess it's sort of like an emergent phenomenon sort of thing. Like it's sort of a sense some novel ideas just came out of nowhere. So to speak. I remember we were working with one uh, large client. They were, they were creating training programs for their people and they were 
And it, 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 it was taking a very long time to, to complete the full uh, certification and training in a particular area uh, for, their, uh, for their employees. And they, they, they were trying to figure out a way to, to improve it, improve the efficiency of their training. And it became uh, just at, at, through a lot of discussion and, and a lot, but just, you know, people were like me were bringing in st- things like data analytics. Oh, let's collect data on how people are performing. Let's collect data on this and that. So I was very, uh, you know, I, was, I was having my very data intensive moment there. But what really emerged out of the conversation was the real sticking point in every training program uh, that's that's a that's a group training program is the is the uh, the weakest link. I hate to say it that way, but the person who's having the most difficulty with a particular topic slows down that conversation for the entire class. And then we move on to the next topic and maybe it's a a different person who has a different uh, issue with trying to learn that particular topic. So that slows the class down. So what they what they what they decided to do is, is try to identify you know where those uh, specific needs are for individual people and and have that person go through that part on their own sort of slowly and th- and then they and then the re- and then everyone else could be moving at their at the at the, sort of the pace of of the course uh, until they have a hard p- stop with something then they can sort of step aside and learn that hard thing so so basically they were able to reduce the entire training time from like 18 months to like 2 months i mean they were just like dumbfounded well, that, that, that this was even a possible solution. I mean, it just sort of emerged out of the conversation. It says, why are we slowing everybody down? But the other thing that was very interesting out of, the, out of that conversation was we, the focus was always on that person who's the slow mover, the, the, the weakest link. That, that, then someone said, well, what about the strongest link? All right. So, so, so people sort of le- left out of the discussion, the person who might be just slowing down the class because they're bored because they're so they, they've grasped it so quickly and so fast uh you know it's sort of like the gifted and talented student in the classroom that person is going to get it right away so so move that person along fast and then they can become an assistant to the rest of the class so 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 th- that's just one example in terms of training but but the idea is, is getting those creative ideas from people at all levels uh accepting it uh believing that you know you don't have to be an executive in a corporation to have you know the next best idea for the corporation and i think the more you get people power like that but also put these systems and tools in their hands with where it were in some sense they're 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 actually hands-on with actually running business processes they they could come up come up with ideas on how to make them more efficient or more meaningful or more value driven and i think that uh these these sort of understandings of, of operating models of business uh, is, is a way a much deeper conversation that that Jeremiah is presenting to us than than one that I've sort of uh, tri- uh, fallen back on all too easily, which is oh, culture, you know, culture is the most important thing in in adopting analytics. Culture is the most important thing in adopting AI. Uh, that's just a soft and not very deep statement, you know. And I, I recognize that I was you know I was able just to mouth the words, but not, not really giving like really transformational. Uh, ways of doing that, and I think this uh, the stuff that Jeremiah is presenting here is, is one way to, to to make it real and and to, and to make it understandable across an organization. You know, it's interesting you you bring that up because your your anecdote there about the training um, reminds me of a lot of the work I've done in various contexts, whether it was uh, physical manufacturing or you know working together in the uh, technology world of you know really applying you know Goldrot's theory of constraints. Um, But what's interesting about a constraint-based model is that the constraint is usually invisible to the people experiencing the constraint. And you often need um, to collaborate across, um, you know, disciplines, professions to to identify um, the the constraint. And a lot of what we see in uh, the integration world is that often the uh, technical individuals will identify a constraint with, say, lack of information um, and providing data and analytics. But then the folks actually running the line of business will identify a systems-based constraint in terms of how a given process um, should work, et cetera. So you know, when we say collaborative, I think you're right. We, we need to be specific um, in, in identifying what it is that we're collaborating about. And that is isolating a given problem at a given moment and ensuring that you have different skill sets and professions to be able to attack the the problem collaboratively. And a lot of what we see is this continued, I think, acceleration of, um, you know, I think the the popular term that's been coined is is centers for enablement rather than centers of excellence. uh, So that you have individuals with 
different expertise that are focused on helping to use that expertise uh, to unblock others throughout the organization. If you look at you know, your, your example with the education, um, it took people who understood uh, probably you know, to ped- pedagogy and, and teaching, understood how to measure the process, understood um, actually you know, adult learning and, and psychology of, of how to unlock that together to accelerate the entire system learning velocity. Uh, so I think it, it, you make a good point that you have to be specific about these things and not you take a cargo cult mentality of if you mouth the right words that it will be successful. Thanks for thanks for mentioning Richard Feynman's famous story. <laughs> <laughs> cargo cult. <laughs> I had a class with Richard Feynman, so I'm just <laughs> I'm reminiscing. Oh, <laughs> you, you feel my jealousy from here. <laughs> oh, I, I can actually. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the three books right next to me. <laughs> Great. Now, coming back to sort of the world of integration, uh, we've seen that the amount of time it takes to create an integration, a lot of uh, companies like Snap Logic have been working for a while in trying to shrink that time and make it easier. It used to be uh, that you the way to do it is write scripts and code, and you needed an uh, expert in the IT who could only do the integration. So line of business would be sort of passing on the request, and they're waiting uh, as the backlog keeps increasing. And then a low-code, no-code approach uh, with companies like SnapLogic pioneered, and now you could drag and drop uh, different steps in, in your integration journey, and you could create integration much faster. I mean, an order of magnitude faster. Um, and now the promise of generative AI is that you can deploy it, not only reduce the time, but reduce the skills barrier and empower citizen integrators to do self-service in a managed manner where line of business and IT still enforce the policies and, and retain the controls they, they need, but you're empowering citizen development to do self-service. Um, Kirk, uh, I mean, what do you think the Gen AI impact uh, in this industry would be from your perspective? <laughs> well, I, uh, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was the poll that we took earlier. <laughs> we took this poll at the beginning about what's your favorite a caffeine drink or zero caffeine, uh, coffee, tea, or whatever. And uh, I heard a phrase years ago, and, and it really applies in this situation, which is when you when you have sort of the ability to to have an idea and then implement that idea and not have to wait for five days or five hours, as you say there, basically it means no more coffee runs, right? <laughs> I mean, you could, you could send your request to IT or send your the request to, to someone, to a developer, and then you can uh, take a break or get a cup of coffee while waiting for the reply. But but now it's it's like in real time you can basically generate uh, a script or gener- uh, generate a workflow, uh, you know, almost instantaneously. I mean, we're, we're going to see a demo here shortly, and I'm looking forward to seeing that. The whole idea is is that uh, is that it's it's sort of at the speed of your question or at the speed of your of your inquiry, uh, the, at the speed of your own curiosity. Like, what about this and what about that? You can you can sort of do what if scenarios. Uh, or, or answer specific business questions. Uh, you know, if you need to combine multiple databases and and and, and connect various sources of data, uh, can be done not just by drag and drop, but also through this generative AI in, in, in a very, almost natural language way. And, and uh, correct me about that later, I guess, about uh, how much generative AI is empowering that. I look forward to seeing that demo here. But just get ready, buckle down. You 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 can start generating. Uh, new questions and find and address new business uh, concerns or, or business questions, you know, basically at the speed as you can think of them. And that does drive, um, as we talked about earlier, it is going to drive the inherent complexity of the overall system. Um, and I think what is not um, well communicated here, but it occurred to me as I look at this, is that these are actually um, almost like a Russian nesting doll. Um, and so the code is at the the center the low code builds upon the code because all of our, our low code tooling is effectively code um, um, inside. And, um, you know, in our case, um, Java and, and Python primarily in the back end. And then you know, generative AI is, is, is pre-trained, right? So that's actually pre-trained on the corpus of existing 
positive samples um, to be able to support. But now we have this challenge that I think has been mentioned many times or, or you know, predicted, which is that you have this ever accelerating um, complexity of the system. And so what we're not talking about today, but which is perhaps a companion webinar is how do our abilities to observe system complexity evolve? How do our abilities to manage system complexity evolve? And how do we, we start to um, have the ability to evolve the entire system while we unlock individuals in their local context? Um, and that's something we're also spending a tremendous amount of time on outside of the um, scope of today, but it is a hand in hand um, challenge to you know, evolve the, let's say, ability for the system to remain reliable as it becomes more complex. I don't know, you know, Kirk, do you have any thoughts about that, you know, from a, um, you know, aer aeronautics or astrophysics perspective? I think that's a world where complexity theory has really, you know, been studied very heavily. Well, I certainly think this, this, the, the, your, uh, your analogy here to the stacking doll, uh, the Russian stacking doll is, is very good here because we forget that uh, you know, sort of underneath the facade, so to speak of, of, Say Chat GPT, right? Everyone just everyone's trying out GPT, Chat GPT, and, and writing blogs about it. Even I have done so. <laughs> but underneath the covers, there's an enormous amount of learning of a, from a, a massive training set that has taken place here. And so, even as you said, uh, even low code and no code systems are built on code, right? It's, it's just that we're not seeing it. Uh, so, generative AI might be this little sliver on this chart here, you know, that five minute sliver of that chart. But but beneath that. You know, is, is an enormous uh, data set that has trained uh, that generative AI to do, be able to do this, and and so what was so in some sense it's sort of like you know, <laughs> well and, and I don't know if this is even a good analogy, but in some sense it's sort of like sending people to the moon, right? That that you say we sent people to the moon, that's a simple statement, you know, but but just if you were to un unpack that and write it into an uh, basically a, a full end to end engineering book about how that happened. I mean, you, you couldn't probably even fill, you know, you could fill the entire house and multiple houses with, with the books that were required to do what we just said in one sentence, right? So so I think we, we sort of uh, too easily look at something like this and and, and think it's, a, it's it's magic, okay? And then so that that's, I still remember that sort of famous quote from science writer, I believe yeah. it was Isaac Asimov said, any, any sufficiently advanced... <laughs> Technology will be indistinguishable for magic, and so to some people, generative AI and Chat GPT looks like magic. But but it's really just conditional probabilities use, you know, using statistics on massive data sets that that the, that the likelihood of this particular concept to follow that concept is higher than the other. So this so that's the thing I'm going to put next into the sequence of words or the sequence of steps or the sequence this logic sequence which I'm presenting to you. And so we, so that, so the magic is statistics. Okay. So all the statisticians out there can, can applaud because that's really what it is. Yeah. It's funny. My, my daughter is uh, 14 and her, her friends are beginning to you know, talk about, you know, the rest of their lives in college. And when I have those narrow dad moments, I, I try to encourage them, look, if you want autonomy in your life, Linear algebra, calculus, and statistics. Just master at an undergraduate level. I mean, nothing we're doing is, is above an undergraduate level of, of the union of, of linear algebra. How do you do matrix transformations? Statistics, how do you understand conditional and joint probability you know, over n tuples, et cetera, um, and, and calculus to do backprop. But you know, I think that the promise here is that we're actually um, able to train on the best patterns. Uh, and that means that we're guiding people naturally. And, and as we'll look at the use cases, hey, why do the use cases work? It's because we're training on successful patterns from people who have thought really hard and had to do the five days or two weeks or three months. My first job was writing Perl scripts to retrieve data from, you know, radar uh, systems, organize that for, you know, large scale atmospheric models, et cetera. That was hard. It was brutal. You know, a combination of Fortran, MATLAB, Perl, and, and to actually get the stuff work. But having, you know, codified and wrapped your brain around those patterns, now you can build in a sample library. Now you can actually support um, the, the creation for people that haven't had to go through the, the pain and anguish of, of learning those narrow skills. And I think that's the biggest promise uh, that we have is to really you know, enable people in their own context to take advantage of that larger wisdom and focus through, as you point out, the power of statistics. <laughs> well, in some, yeah. sense, in some sense, it's self-validating because the workflows that are 
uh, that are most successful, that are most used and reused and reused and reused are the ones that are going to, you know, sort, sort of dominate the, that conditional probability. That, that is the most likely thing to happen to be most likely sequence of steps for this particular process is this one, because we've seen it work a thousand or a million times. Well, let's look at those use cases then, because um, I think that that's a great tee up. Um, we're going to talk about um, and give a demo in a little bit about um, uh, something we have in the labs right now that we call Snap GPT. That's exactly this: uh, taking and turning intention um, into integration pipelines. Um, you know, and, and we'll get into the architecture about that. But it it really is of a piece with the conversation we're having here: is can we understand sort of the bulk of the hard things people are working on and allow them to move from a good, concise description of the thing they're trying to accomplish into actual working and running system. Why don't we, why don't we get into the, and discuss the, the use cases we're seeing. Back to you. Yeah, Mike. I think in the webinar, we promised five uh, top five use cases. Uh, since that time, we have discovered a couple of more. So there are two bonus use cases on this <laughs> chart that we have added. Oh, freebies. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. But uh, getting to the meat of our discussion over here is I think the number one use case is what people are trying to do is to integrate faster. They want to create uh, the integration workflow or pipeline. And uh, just like uh, in my job as a product marketer, I have to create a lot of content today. My content writing process starts with ChatGPT or BARD, where I put down my intention. I want to write a blog on generative AI and implications for integration market, and it'll give me some ideas. I'll refine the table of content and ask it to flush it out. And I can do my job quite a bit faster by leveraging it. It gets me off the writer's blog. And that's the advantage, number one, is that you can put in your intention and get the first draft of integration. It's not gonna be perfect because integration is complex, but it gets you keep going. It gives you the right uh, framework to start and then you can tweak it from there and get your integration going faster. Once you've built the integration, I mean, think of yourself in the light, like say I'm a, a, a marketing ops leader in, uh, in SnapLogic and I may be analyzing closed one opportunities. I can cast the intention saying, hey, take uh, closed one opportunities in Q1 from Salesforce and put them in uh, Excel. Uh, or if I happen to be a Snowflake expert, maybe put, put it in Snowflake so I can analyze that data. And boom, you can get a fairly functional, simple pipeline to do your job. Now you don't have to go to uh, a, a, an a specialist or integration specialist to go that. Now, the next thing is, how do I know this pipeline works? Um, I may need to generate sample data. And now I can ask Snap GPT, hey, give me 10 records, opportunity sample data records uh, with uh, uh, these fields that I'm interested in. And it's really good at generating a data that looks meaningful for your test purposes. Now you can plug that into the data and if you want to test before you use it. Uh, if you, you're looking at a particular snap or connector, uh, we are training it so that it can fine tune the expression. If it is not perfect, you can interact in natural language, ask it to do it. Now on the other side, if I am a line of business IT person who's more comfortable in SQL, but not an expert in SQL, I might go in and pick up the SQL equivalent snap that we have in our product for Salesforce and type in the intent that, hey, select all the opportunities closed in one in Q1 uh, of, uh, or since 2021 and add them into Snowflake and now it gives you a perfectly formed SQL query, the, something you're more comfortable with. Uh, similarly, now a lot of people have uh, templates or patterns. We have a lot of patterns. Um, I might go in there uh, as a line of business IT that I'm helping, um, helping do um, onboarding process and automate them. And I may ask it to recommend uh, uh, automating onboarding process in Workday 
and it'll search through and recommend the pro uh, uh, patterns you could use. You could ask for help on various topics, how to build a pipeline, how to, which snap should I use for this kind of integration? And finally, uh, as I was talking about the marketing ops leader, uh, I could be, uh, uh, I've created this and then uh, I want to document it uh, for others to understand it. I can just ask uh, Snap GPT to describe the pipeline and got perfect description that can be useful for everyone. Or somebody else opens the pipeline. If they want to understand what it does, they can say describe the pipeline. So those are some of the use cases. Jeremiah, please uh, uh, expand on those if I've missed some of them. No, I think I think this is a good roundup um, of the seven <laughs> two for free uh, extra use cases. And I think if we go back to earlier conversation, I think I think these are emergent. We're just watching this in our labs and environment and seeing how our colleagues, even at SnapLogic, are using these capabilities. And you know, I think the um, what what we're most often seeing is that across the skill set, as as you pointed, look, you have spent your career learning how to communicate with the written word, uh, how to succinctly communicate ideas, et cetera. And, and what you described with, you know, the, um, you know, ChatGPT, BARD, et cetera, of helping you get to the place where your expertise is most needed, which is the fine tuning, editing and production is what we're seeing in the integration world as well. Um, and so, you know, moving from the blank canvas, if you will, the first draft where then you start to iterate, et cetera. A, a good friend of mine, um, our, our chief scientist, Greg Benson, says debugging is where the real work and the real value is created, right? And it's those iterations once you're starting to, to work with um, data and, and your system that happens. So I think that that first integration, you know, that, that first draft is often the huge accelerant. Also generating the, the sample data to test that. And then... You know, inevitably, at the the where all integration, I don't care what pattern you're doing, streaming, batch, application, data, inevitably that the time is spent mapping schemas to each other and reformatting or transforming uh, data along the way. Um, and and that's really where the ability to think in code, if you will, becomes very hard, even for people that have done it a, a long time. Um, been doing this for couple of decades now, and I still have to look up regex you know, rules and stuff like that because it's hard. Um, and so that's a lot of what we're seeing in terms of the, the patterns that are, that are coming out here. Um, our first production pipeline at SnapLogic using SnapGPT was actually from um, Annette, who, who uh, leads our training department. Um, uh, she's, you know, been in training her entire career. She's, she's you know, a teacher and, and helps to support um, our customers uh, who are, are you know, looking to, to get um, training and, and go forth. And she was struggling with um, doing a uh, calculation on, um, you know, progress of students, you know, kind of back to Kirk's uh, example earlier unintentionally. Um, how are people progressing in the program? She had the data, but she's not a data scientist or, you know, mathematician. Or whatever. She knew what her joint filter conditions were, but she couldn't you know, quite, quite get it to work in Excel or whatever. And so she went in and, and actually built a pipeline to do it. I'll, I'll share, I'll actually show you her community post uh, when, when we get into the demo. But, you know, I think that at the core of it is, is unblocking people at the point of the challenge. And I think, you know, these are, are where we see, you know, emergent um, use cases. And you can see the, you know, hours, days, and weeks that are embedded in, in these blocks that, that now we can unblock. I don't know, I mean, do these, do these resonate with you, Kirk? Yeah, definitely. I, I, well, well, the very first one <laughs> caught my attention immediately. Of course, this, this whole idea of writer's block. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm in sort of uh, that mode right now. I got, I got the, a lot of blogs I need to write. I'm, I'm trying to get that first idea right. So, 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 one of the ways I'm thinking about this, going back to my earlier comments about the idea thons that we were running when I was at Booz Allen, you know, where people sit around the table and they, they you know, sort of come up with an idea, right? And a lot of times uh, in small groups or even in larger groups, it sometimes starts with someone at a whiteboard, right? Someone just standing at a whiteboard and they draw a block, okay? And maybe this is like, what, what's our goal? Uh, what are the inputs? I mean, so you start drawing things on the board and you start drawing lines and connecting things. And it's really sort of this process right here, right? You're sort of like creating a workflow from scratch. And, and then people say, no, no, it should be that. This should, that should go there. This should connect to that. And so, and so, so in a sense, uh, this tool 
because uh, it's, it's looking upon the, the whole history of, of prior workflows that people have used. That first draft is a really good sort of starting point. So, uh, so I like to, I almost like to think of this as like an idea as a service or idea thon as a service, right? So, help give me an idea of how, how I can do this integration or I can do this workflow. And so that, that first draft just can be presented to you. And, th and then again, you, you can edit it, you can debug it, refine it, you know, generate the sample data to test it and, and all those kind of things. So, so you're in, in some sense, you're getting th this sort of as a service capability to generate the idea, to, to explore the idea, to test it and, and to and improve and perfect, perfect that idea. It, it's funny you say that the other way that I learn is by reading other people's code. Um, and if there's one thing that is consistent about other, and I don't care what level of abstraction, you know, that you're at, but if there's one thing that's consistent about all of us, we don't do a good job documenting our own work. <laughs> it's just, it's just true. And one of the really interesting things about, um, you know, I, re I, I resemble that remark. <laughs> One of the, the interesting things about transformer-based architectures, and I'd encourage people to look into this in your own code bases, is that you can um, effectively gain documentation um, on the fly. Um, and, and so, you know, for example, um, with uh, integrations that we have here, the, the we have the ability to abstract the integration, send that over to the Metamall, and have it summarize or, or describe the integration itself. So that's not only documentation at creation time, but also helps with I mean, documentation debt, um, if you will. Uh, that, that's another interesting use case we're seeing is that people are able to effectively go back into existing um, code bases. Uh, we found only 3% of, you know, we showed the chord graph at the beginning of the uh, presentation. Um, in terms of looking at the, the usage, only 3% of all of those hundreds of millions of pipelines um, have the info tab filled out on the, on the pipeline. So they maybe they're documented a wiki or something and I don't know it, but um, it is, is really interesting. So what, what this has taught me to do is sort of think laterally on how these technologies can help as well, but you know, creating the, the integration itself is definitely interesting and valuable, um, but the ability to generate data to you know, use in other areas or to do configurations to, to access help, but also to document existing work, um, I think is interesting. Um, yeah, and, and you know, there's a couple of questions. I think this is a good spot to to address um, in in the in the Q and A before we get there because it is in context here. Um, is is Lori asks us? Um, you know, she's also uses AI as a first draft or content creation, but is occasionally uneasy about the ethics of data or content ownership. What are our thoughts on how to eth ethically utilize um, all, all that AI stuff? Well, I, I can only offer that from, from my context and, and my um, area of, of responsibility, um, Lori. As a provider of these tools, we take this incredibly seriously. And we've, we've authored an internal um, policy and, and rolled out to our employees in terms of how we uh, approach utilization of these tools when it comes to employee data, when it comes to customer data. Um, one of the challenges I think that we have in the market right now is that um, the training corpuses are not all knowable. And I think that's a problem. I, I think we really need to do um, as, a, as a community, much better documentation of the, the training. I think that's gonna shake itself out. You see what's happening at Reddit and other places right now. Um, so the upstream data, but we should control proactively what we can control. Um, and, and that means you know being um, focused on having you know sort of a, a high level of respect for the intellectual property um, of others, particularly when it comes to the different approaches, whether you're doing zero shot, few shot, you know, fine tuning or, or pre-training um, itself. So and my, my thoughts on how to ethically utilize all that AI has to offer is to take accountability and responsibility for the, the scope that you have and, and ask that for your counterparts um, as well and, and be specific about it. I don't know what your thoughts are on, on that, Kirk. Yeah, I think this this is an ongoing problem, right? I mean, back in the day, you know, like 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 in the student environment. I mean, I, I mean, I did. I was a student of once, like we all were. I was a teacher <laughs> once. Uh, you worry about students, uh, you know, plagiarizing, you know, just cut and pasting. That's always been a problem, whether it's Wikipedia or in, or in back in the early days of my, of my youth, it's an encyclopedia. So would just a student could just copy verbatim, and and so this just makes it easier or in a different way. Uh, than those things perhaps uh so, so we really have to uh you know 
we just have to inspire more, uh, you know, confidence and people that they, they can create their a good content on their own. They, they can use this as a, as a template or as a, you know, a, a thought starter or, or, or you know, a, a writer's block <laughs> crusher. Uh, so I've actually done that. I, I was writing a blog on something and then I, I just was, couldn't get my, had a very specific topic to write on. So I just asked chat PG to chat GPT to create an outline for a blog on that topic. And I didn't even follow the outline it suggested to me. But what happened was, but as I read through the outline, I, I started thinking of all these things that, that, that were related to that outline uh, that I, that I, that I could write on my own, out, out of my own head. So, so even though I, I did use ChatGPT to, for that thought starter, starter, it, it didn't actually get reflected in, in any other way than it just triggered thoughts in my head that I then wrote down into the blog. So, so hopefully people uh, can be more trusting of their own creativity, uh, and, and it's okay to admit that you do have writer's block if you have it. I, I, I can admit it. I sometimes I sit on a, on a blog request for like several days, and then all of a sudden, what it just comes to me one day with when I'm writing. So I think uh, having uh, that kind of uh, writer's block, in, like for an, for example, and in, in the context of, of, of Snap Logic, I mean, a business workflow, you don't have five days to think of the the, the most perfect uh, workflow, the most perfect connectors, the most perfect building blocks, you know, and the most perfect sample data. You you can have a tool help you along that way, and, and of course, again, it's easier to debug than to create from scratch. So I think, you know, you know, the more we recognize how we we can be creative at the same time as having a little uh, push in the right direction is also a good thing. So I think we're coming, uh, nearing the end. Uh, I'm wondering if we should, should show the product to the people. Uh, Jeremiah over here with some of the <laughs> yeah. actual prompts. Uh, I want to, what do you think, Jeremiah? Yeah, I mean, those of us that are that are getting our hands dirty right now working on this stuff um, probably makes sense. So why don't I um, go ahead and, um, you know, go ahead and share uh, the, the window here. And I'm going to jump into um, actually looking at the um, our community. So I mentioned, you know, looking at, at the, um, the work that we've done. So we have an evolving prompt catalog, just like we've all seen on Twitter or other places where people are sharing their, um, you know, chat GPT uh, prompts. There's, this is no different. Um, so that, that's kind of fun and interesting. And this is also where uh, my, my colleague Annette, um, you know, shared hers. And I, I, I want to share this because I think it's so much fun to watch um, people gain skills they didn't have before. Like that, that is so much fun. And this is you know, something that Annette and our training department had been struggling with for a while. Um, and uh, she said, gosh, I hear the Jeremiah people talking about this so much. I'm going to go into the labs environment and see if I can get it to work for myself. Um, and, and so as you can see here, you know, she needed to read a CSV file, map registered last name, email percent complete, filter records, and then, and then you know, write out to a CSV file. But the thing that was magical for her was the creation of this JavaScript-like uh, filter expression that she was really you know, having challenges with in other environments. And, and I think that level of enablement is, is really fun. So, you know, if I go back over here to, to our Snap Lab system, so this is our system we refresh every month where we take our latest production release and then we layer on experiments, whether those experiments in visualization, in, you know, pipeline construction, in how we think about the, the ultimate runtime. And here is, you know, we've added the, the Snap GPT um, pane to the right side. So we kind of have three big skill domains right now. Um, ask, ask for help, access uh, documentation, uh, create and configure pipelines and uh, document or describe the pipeline you have. So, you know, uh, how do I build a pipeline, you know, in Snap Logic? Um, it, you know, in terms of asking for um, help, you can, you see this is much the same user interaction um, that that you would have in in say chat GPT or Bard, et cetera. And, and on that note, we are experimenting across the board. We're working with uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo on Azure using their you know bounded environments. We're working with um, uh, AWS with, with Titan and you know Anthropic Cloud and as well with with Google uh, Vertex and the Palm you know Bison Code Bison et cetera variants. So you know this is a time where you should be kind of looking at the different options. Also the hugging face open source models et cetera. Uh, so that's you know asking for help, um, you know, and, and I grabbed one of the prompts out of the prompt catalog uh, here to create a pipeline using Salesforce. Read, 
uh, to fetch my um, opportunities, filter out any opportunities outside the last fiscal quarter and write them to Snowflake. So I use this example because a lot of these point-to-point -point integrations exist and you could go ask people in the IT department to, to use them. The challenges start to get in when you are looking for special conditions, filters that seem self-evident and obvious um, to, to us as an individual, um, but are not necessarily in the um, you know, process it, it, itself. And so you see here, now we're getting a proposal from the system and we'll go ahead and import that in, in a new tab. And, and we're also providing contextual help here. So we're saying, where has SnapGPT you know, looked to help us? SFL uh, opportunities, stuff like it, even suggesting um, uh, a, a name for my pipeline. I'm gonna go ahead and save that. And now, oops, sorry about that. You know, we, we start to get into a, a wizard uh, to, to configure for accounts and things. So of course that's not trainable or, or knowable. I'm not gonna go through that whole process here. Well, what I do think is interesting here is is we are you know, basically trying to help again, get past that writer's block. And then not only we get past the writer's block, we're saying, hey, you need to edit and author in these other areas because that's you know, fundamentally not knowable. You know, here's the, the filter um, expression uh, that, that was generated and then Snowflake um, a, as well. You know, I, think, I think what is also interesting um, with these types of prompts is that uh, you, can, you can get more and more complex. At the moment, we're not in that sort of iterative expansion um, you know, pace yet, uh, but, but interesting. You know, what's really fun though, is that um, because you're relying on these large language models, um, uh, you know, from let's say English, uh, give me a language, Manish. Spanish. Oh, that's an easy one. Um, so if, if I take um, and I put that same prompt um, in here, uh, you know, it's been a while since my AP Spanish back in, in high school. What's interesting is because we're using these models that have been, you know, cross-trained on a multilingual um, corpus, uh, we're able to, you know, effectively um, utilize the inherent knowledge that's in that. Because, of course, sequence to sequence started off with translation. Uh, and, and so that's really, and what's interesting here is now we effectively have gotten a new um, pipeline um, you'll see the label is different here. The first one had had underscores, um, you know, uh, and um, it, it is a separate, different pipeline, um, but is effectively, uh, in this case, we're getting good coherence on on the two pipelines themselves. Um, so, you know, before last quarter, and this was the other one um, we did, you know, greater than or equal to last quarter. There's some variance here, uh, but yeah, I think our, our multilingual and we're using insert rather than, than an upstart. Uh, but what's interesting here is that we also have colleagues who come from other cultures who will work in our, our context, but the way they think and their intention is in their native language. Um, so I, I think that's also rather interesting. I'm just going to go back to the, the first pipeline we created here and ask it to describe. And, and there is no... Um, information that is being looked up here. What we're doing is we're extracting the data, um, doing quite a bit of sophisticated prompt engineering, and then using the large language model to now describe um, the, the data uh, here, which, which is, again, I think an accelerant and, and interesting um, in terms of where we go forward next. Uh, if, if I go to the info tab here, again, the documentation isn't there. Um, but we're increasingly getting to the point where we think we'll auto-populate, we'll offer people the ability to go back and, and back-populate uh, their existing, um, you know, uh, portfolios, uh, et cetera. So we only have about five minutes left. We've got a couple more, um, you know, wrap-ups, uh, but we're extremely excited about the potential this has. This is our lab environment. I wasn't sure if it wasn't going to fall in its face uh, while we were demoing it today because uh, we're moving really fast. We are looking to get this into production um, as, as quickly as possible. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and if anybody wants more follow-ups, I, you know, I will be happy to bore you for hours, um, with, with, uh, you know, kind of this emergent thing. There was another question in the chat though. How are we looking to train this, um, and expand it? We actually have an internal, um, project that we'll probably take to the community called snap GPT college. And to become part of the faculty of the college uh, in Kirk, it's an open offer. Uh, you have to submit five well-documented pipelines. And then we're using those in, in um, fine tuning and few shot training by basically taking the BERT methodology, if you're familiar with that, and adding um, layers on top to either do a tuning process or using it in, we call it the few shot catalog at the moment because we're using that really just in, in the 
context window today. Um, here are some you know, other use cases uh, by, by persona. Uh, we, we talked about the, the sales one, the HR, finance, even in production, um, I've, I've seen people working on, on sort of shop floor uh, style um, use cases or even specialty systems like, a, you know, patient care, uh, et, et cetera. I do want to kind of briefly talk about, so it kind of crystallizes what it is we did, what was the magic behind the system there. Um, and so you saw the user prompt and you saw the, the pipeline come out the other end. Uh, what we're doing in the process there is we're using a keyword extraction uh, using some tokenization techniques uh, to identify the intent. We're down selecting using that to go against a um, high quality uh, pipeline catalog uh, and, and data samples that have been extracted and generalized uh, from, from runtime with a good coverage across the different endpoints and different integration uh, patterns, whether it's real time, batch, scheduled, et cetera. We're then adding additional context for our documentation and that then goes into the, the model as a prompt. So our prompt that we're actually passing to the model is maximizing its use of the context window, even using soft parameter tuning or, or other um, you know, uh, embeddings effectively. And then we're using the post-processing to, to create the prompt. Um, so you know, it, it is a whole new engineering discipline to use these models that it relies heavily on you know, good old coding design and understanding statistics. But um, you, your your uh, audio wasn't on 2x. I was just trying to get the demo <laughs> here to get us to. The oh, end. okay. I was just checking that. <laughs> back, back to you, Manish. I just I want to comment. Can, can I just comment quickly? I, I mean, I think the whole there's such a huge importance around context. I mean, I see that in the in the in the chat already. Uh, but but that intent a lot of times is based on content uh, context, right? I mean, so if you're shopping online, it, it, where, where, what's your context? Are you at work? Are you at home? Are you on vacation? Are you at a at a rock concert? I mean, I mean, what you're what you're doing is is the intent is often driven by the context in which you know that 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 conversation starts, and so I really like the fact that that's included here and not and not just the um, just keywords. Yeah, no, those are great. Like. Uh... Uh, you know, Jeremiah, you were mentioning today uh, we are taking a prompt engineering approach and we are only, I, I know a lot of times people are really concerned about the type of data we are sending to ChatGPT and we want to assure you the only customer specific data we are sending is the user prompt itself. The rest of the data is what we own. We give it further context and it's simply not that we are sending the prompt and generating the pipeline. You're doing a ton of prep work, getting the context, the right patterns, high quality pipelines, data sample. But those are all that Snap Logic owns and has it, uh, and that we send out and do it. Jeremiah, how, what are the other research areas you mentioned? We are talking to Google, Anthropic, and AWS. Uh, where do you see it going? Yeah, you know. Um... You know where where we're headed is is how do we effectively build the highest performing models across the greatest number of skill sets possible, uh, and that that really is is the direction we're headed in right now. And I think the the challenge is how do you um, effectively take a image of the um, you know frozen uh, weights of the the language model and then extend um, beyond that with few shot or or fine tuning um, on top. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fun and exciting time. And that's really where these big providers are headed um, right now is the ability to, to do fine tuning, et cetera, because they know that as powerful as these large language models are, they, are, they don't have access to um, narrow bands of information like um, integration um, patterns and models in, in a lot of the data that is not on the public web. And so we need to figure out a way to mash these up in a safe, ethical, you know, balanced way. And that's where a lot of the research is right now. Great. Uh, I mean, the one uh, hour flew, flew by so quickly. So thank you, Kirk, for joining us today. Really loved your insights and Jeremiah for walking us through some of the details under the covered look at Snap GPT. We encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about SnapGPT, you can join the wait list. Uh, uh, we are, every week we are adding customers. We have uh, 
dozens of customers who are testing it, uh, including our resource uh, internally. And so uh, stay tuned for developments. We'll be sharing them regularly with you. We have a monthly Snap Labs corners and, and through webinars like this. So thank you again for joining me. And thank you, Kirk and Jeremiah. Yeah, and I would say sign up, get on the wait list. Um, we are letting people in as quickly as possible based on our ability to provide a high quality experience and the API performance has not been great. Uh, but sign up, get on the wait list. As soon as you're in there, you get access to the, the community and the system itself to just bang on this thing yourself and, and have a lot of fun. It is it is a joy. It's a lot of fun. Thank you so much, um, Kirk. I've learned a lot uh, from you. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Uh, and <laughs> You know, keep keep teaching us, keep keep helping us understand where the boundaries are, and and we'll all help each other kind of grapple with and master this new world we're in. Well, thank you, everyone. That was a great session. Um, finally, we highly value your feedback to help us uh, keep on shaping our future events and to provide you the best and most useful insights we can. So, please. Leave your comments via the poll, which you will see on the window below. Your comments would be confidential, and they are only